significant problem in that the um, pests are developing tolerance, so we're getting stronger poisons going into the marketplace. The average consumer, as you pointed out, doesn't really have the knowledge on where they're allowed to use it, how much to use it. Um, and um, the LA Times a few weeks ago had a front page article on mountain lions. Yeah, yeah I saw that. Um, where a mountain lion, they had a picture of the same one taken um, a couple of months difference in time, and mange, which is becoming a big problem in mountain lions, it seems like most of the mountain lions have mange, you, you probably read the article more carefully than I, they're finding residual poison from the critters right. that the mountain lions have been eating. So, are we on a slippery slope here where the average consumer without your level of expertise is using these poisons? Oh, good question. And the answer is, um, actually, DPR, California Department of Pesticide Regulation, has actually just enacted a new law, I don't know what you call it, regulation, thank you, um, where second generation antifragments are going restricted use as of July 1st of this year. I mean, not only are they going restricted use, but they're also completely removing them from stores immediately. And if you have um, own product, you're technically not supposed to use it unless you're a certified applicator after July 1st. Most materials, usually if you've bought them, you can, even when they change regulations, you can continue to use them until you use up your stores. In this case, they're basically saying at July 1st, if you're not a certified applicator, you're not allowed to use it. Which means pest control companies will still be able to use those materials to come in and control rats and mice, the, the professionals, so to speak. But homeowners will, never, will not be able to use those materials. So anymore. there's not going to be any rep There will be. There will be. Just not second generation anticoagulants. So there will be things in their place that are considered to be much safer. So first generation anticoagulants will be available. Difasno, chlorofasno, warfarin. Also bromethylene, which is an entirely different toxin that we're not talking about today. I try not to get too much into the weeds, but we always get drug into the weeds here. Uh, and I understand why. It's an interesting topic. Um, there, but long story short, there will be options, just not the second generation antiquities. And restricted, restricted use means you have to have a license to present. Okay. Yeah. So in the interest of time, we've kind of covered some of this information, but we're going to slowly move on to covering a little bit of other detail on some of this. Um, with the anticoagulants, I think it behooves you to know that there are different techniques out there for applying these anticoagulants for species like ground squirrels and, and, um, and voles. Uh, these include spot treatments, broadcast applications, or bait stations. Spot treatments are used when you have just a few burrow systems to treat. You're basically hand scattering bait around the opening. That works well if you've got just one or two burrow systems to treat, but if you have a lot to treat, that's very time consuming, there are better options, such as broadcast applications, which is where you have something like a seed spreader that spreads bait thinly over a larger area. Homeowners aren't going to use this, but golf courses, schoolyards, no, not schoolyards, golf courses, um, non use areas, things like that might utilize techniques like this. Um, Bait stations are also used quite a bit, too. We know the theory behind a bait station is you put the bait in and it excludes, excludes species larger than that opening. Um, so from a primary toxicity perspective, it's a safer way to go. But believe it or not, um, research has been done to show that from a secondary toxicity perspective, bait stations can be a little bit more hazardous. And the reason why is that with these anticoagulants, the squirrels can come in and feed for up to five or so days before they get that toxic dose and eventually die. Uh, so with a big, abundant bait supply, they can eat a lot of bait over the course of that five-day period, and it builds up to higher levels in the animal. Uh, so that poses a slightly greater risk for secondary toxicity. The broadcast application, counter to what a lot of people think, is actually, in a lot of cases, the safest technique because they get just enough of that bait to get a toxic dose, but not enough to build up to very high levels. So when you think about this idea of broadcasting bait out there, it's not necessarily a bad idea. You have to realize they're spreading it very thin. We're talking two or three grains per square foot. This is a very thin spreading. So cats and dogs in no way, shape, or form are adapted to go out there and pick up enough bait to get a toxic dose like that. Only species that are granivores that are used to going along and picking up grain could possibly get enough to get a toxic dose that way. <clears throat> Zinc phosphide, 
I'm only going to hit this very quickly because it's a, it's a restricted use material and it's not allowed for use in and around buildings. So there aren't many cases where somebody would call you up with a question about zinc phosphide. But I like to at least mention it because somebody could call you up and say, hey, I heard about this thing called zinc phosphide. At least you've heard about it now. Um, it is an acute toxin. kills after a single feed. But it has a very distinctive odor and taste to it. Uh, it's kind of garlicky type odor that rodents oftentimes don't particularly care for. So we see a lot of bait shyness with zinc phosphide. The animals don't always consume it at a very high rate. But one of the real benefits of zinc phosphide is that it has no secondary toxicity concern associated with it. Uh, so you can use it. If it kills the ground squirrels and something comes along and eats the ground squirrel, it will be perfectly safe to consume. The reason why is what happens is the animal consumes this. When it consumes it, it interacts with the acid in the stomach to emit phosphine gas. It's the gas that kills the animal. But once the animal dies, the gas leaves the body. And so something can come along and feed on it, and it will be safe to feed on. Um, so that's a real benefit of zinc phosphide. But it is an acute toxin. And because it's an acute toxin, we can't use it in and around buildings. Also, we don't use it in bait stations. I mentioned this, too. Um, because it's got that strong odor to it, if you put it in a bait station, it magnifies that odor, and nothing's going to come in there. So it just doesn't work. Um, pocket gophers. Uh, Strychnine is the most um, effective of the baits used for pocket gophers. Um, we, the only species we can use strychnine for yet is pocket gophers. The reason why, it's, it's a pretty toxic material. But we can use it for gophers because we're applying directly into the burrow system and no other animal lives in that burrow system. Uh, so we can effectively target that species that way. Um, strychnine is the most effective, but unfortunately, strychnine is also strychnine baits are very difficult to find right now. Uh, there's a real shortage of strychnine. There's almost I think there's one company that's still importing strychnine into the U.S. So you're probably going to have to look at alternatives to strychnine. You may get phone calls from people saying, "Hey, I always used strychnine in the past to control gophers, but now I can't find it." Well, you can tell them it's a supply issue is why. And secondly, it's probably going to be very difficult to find going forward. So if they want to continue to use baits, they might have to look at zinc phosphide or anticoagulant alternatives. Um, we're actually running a study right now to test the efficacy of some of these products because efficacy for pocket gopher baits tends to be pretty spotty. It's all over the board. The reason why is that the baits we use for gophers are seed-based baits or pelletized baits. But gophers don't eat seeds. They eat vegetation and they eat root systems. We use seeds because it's the only practical way of getting the bait into the burrow system. Um, but it's really not the most effective option in a lot of cases. I like trapping or burrow fumigation better. And so that I would recommend trapping for most homeowners before I would recommend baiting. Um, if they can get strychnine, it would be the best of the baits. My guess is that zinc phosphide is the second best. But we're running trials <coughs> right now, so we're not really sure. As far as application techniques, you can use a probe to probe down into the burrow system, insert a funnel into that hole, spoon the appropriate amount of bait into that uh, funnel, it goes down into the burrow system, you then cover that opening up, move on. Um, that's a way to treat one or two gophers in your backyard. If you've got lots of gophers, so that's time consuming. So you can use one of these all-in-one probe and bait dispensers. Basically, it's a probe that you probe down in, you crank a lever, and it deposits a preset amount of bait directly into the burrow system. So it's a quicker way of treating. Um, it's just, these are kind of expensive. Really cheap versions are 50 bucks. And they're really cheap, though. Um, if you want one that actually works very well, you're looking at 200, 250 bucks at least. So it's not something that somebody's going to do to apply bait two or three times a year. They're going to want to use this technique. But if there's lots of area that they've got to treat, this is something they can use. I like to throw this up there just so you know. Um, there's actually a burrow builder device that's used in, in production ag as well that creates an artificial burrow and deposits bait at set intervals. Uh, within that burrow system. And so that kind of approach is used in, in larger areas too. Of course, there's burrow fumigation. We've talked a little bit about fumigation. <clears throat> With fumigation, we're talking about the use of toxic um, gases within a burrow system. Uh, we've mentioned several times that it works best when soil moisture is high. This is a really key part here. Uh, so late winter, early spring is great for gophers. After ground squirrels emerge in spring, it's good for ground squirrels. But remember this part. They need to emerge. A lot of times people think they're hibernating. Great, I'll get them then because they're in the burrow system. And I can see why they think that. But the problem is, is they actually wall themselves off in that burrow system when they hibernate so that snakes and other animals can't get to them. So while they have that wall up in the burrow system, the gases cannot get to them at a high enough rate to be effective. So you have to wait until ground squirrels have come up above ground and are active in the springtime before you utilize um, burrow fumigants. 
Of course, though, fumigant should never be used in or around buildings. And this is an important point to realize. Um, these burrow systems sometimes can go 25 or maybe even 50 feet if we're talking about pocket gophers. Um, so you don't want to use them in and around buildings. That greatly limits where in residential areas burrow fumigants can be used. But still, there are parks and playgrounds and places like that where these fumigants can be used, people with larger yards, places like that. And they can be pretty effective. But do, do realize that in a lot of cases, fumigants um, cannot be used around buildings. As far as fumigants out there, um, there are two historically that have been used. One is aluminum phosphide. Uh, common commercial names are phostoxin or fumatoxin. Essentially what they are are tablets or pellets that you introduce into the burrow system then reacts with the moisture in the burrow system to emit phosphine gas, and it's that gas that kills the animal. So very similar to zinc phosphide. The only difference is, in this case, it reacts with the moisture in the burrow system to create the gas directly, whereas with zinc phosphide, the animal has, actually has to ingest it before it um, uh, creates that phosphine gas. <clears throat> this is an effective technique for both ground squirrels and pocket gophers. In fact, it is probably the most effective technique that we have available for managing these species. Uh, ground squirrels, uh, studies that I've either been involved with or have, have looked at the studies for show 97 to 100% efficacy of burrow systems treated. Pocket gophers, same thing, except a little bit, a little bit more variable, usually around 90 to 100% efficacy. Still highly effective. The downside is this is also a highly restricted use of material. So the average homeowner will not be able to use this. I mention this in these kinds of settings for those individuals who get calls from people that say, I've had gopher problems for 10 years. I've never been able to do anything with them. I've got lots of gophers. I don't know what to do. You can tell them that there is a product called aluminum phosphide, and that a lot of your professional pest control companies are certified to use it. And they could come out and use this. And this is a very effective technique for dealing with these species. Uh, so keep that in mind. So the ground squirrels, they don't burrow as close to the village. So it's OK to do it for ground squirrels near closer to buildings or no, not no. at all. You can't no. do anything. It doesn't matter the species, the yeah. Okay. So it depends on the product. Uh, aluminum phosphide actually is 100 feet. You have to be 100 feet from any structure that is currently or may be occupied by humans, pets, or livestock. So that really limits <coughs> where it can be used. But still there are places where they can be used and are used quite a bit in residential areas. Gas cartridges, which we'll see here in a second, don't have quite that lengthy of a restriction. And you'd have to read the label. Each one's a little bit different. It's probably 25 feet to 50 feet, somewhere in through there on those labels. Can gardeners get access to restricted restricted No. I mean, you would have to be a certified, you'd, you'd have to have a QAC or a QAL, or in some cases a PAC, a private applicator certificate. Um, so, no, your average gardener would not be able to, to get access to it. Now, we also have gas cartridges. Um, gas cartridges, I guess you could think of as a glorified smoke bomb. Um, basically, it's got a fuse, you light, you shove the, the gas cartridge into the burrow system, creates a lot of smoke, a lot of carbon monoxide, it essentially asphyxiates the animal. These are pretty effective for ground squirrels. Uh, around, let's say, average about 75% efficacy. So that's pretty good. Uh, it's better than, than a lot of options that we have. It's not as efficacious as aluminum phosphide, and it's more expensive. These are about $1.67 to $2 to $2.5 per stick, depending upon the product that you buy. Aluminum phosphide is only about $0.16 cents per burrow system to treat, so it's a much cheaper product. But these are not restricted use material. <clears throat> you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot right now and buy giant destroyers or whatever, smoke bombs or whatever some of the other names are. Uh, for these products. So that's the really nice thing about these. These are not restricted use. This is something that um, uh, a homeowner or a gardener could potentially use, but they still have to stay away from buildings. Don't they work on gophers too? So that was what I was going to get to. Um, but that's fine. We'll segue right into that. They work pretty well for ground squirrels. They do not work well for gophers. Gophers are on the label. They say they work great for gophers, but they really do not. Uh, gophers seem to sense the smoke when they feel that smoke, they just build a wall up in their tunnel and move on somewhere else. So it does not build up to, to high enough levels in most cases. You, you'll get a few occasionally with gophers, but nowhere near worth the cost in most cases of, of trying them out. And in fact, I think it states that in the pest notes too, to stay away from, from smoke bombs for, for gophers. Oh, and then the other thing to, to keep in mind too is that they do have a tendency to flare up. 
So be careful. They'll start things on fire. Um, in particular, don't use them where you have a lot of dry grass or something like that. But keep in mind, once again, we're supposed to be using these when we have relatively wet soil conditions. So you shouldn't have a lot of dry grass around them. Um, but you do need to be careful where you use them. Oh, I guess I didn't include it probably for time sake. I'll just mention briefly. <clears throat> we do have one other uh, form of borough fumigation now, too, that was legalized as of the 1st of 2012. And that is the use of carbon monoxide producing machines. Uh, these are machines that basically create exhaust and you can pump the exhaust into the barrel system. It is a legal technique now. Uh, we are running trials on efficacy um, as we speak, really. Um, but we've been doing it for a few years for gophers. Efficacy is, is okay, let's say 60 to 70 percent efficacy. Uh, not as good as some other techniques, but it's not horrible. Uh, we're actually going to be starting some work on ground squirrels next week uh, to look at efficacy for it, too. So these products are out there, but it's not going to be a homeowner thing to purchase because they're very expensive machines. But a lot of golf courses and a lot of school districts and places like that are buying them now as an alternative for pest control. So you may hear about them from folks like that. Um, frightening devices. Frightening devices are used pretty much exclusively for bird species. These include both visual and auditory devices. Visual devices would include things like sterile balloons, mylar streamers, hanging CDs up in trees, etc. Um, most of these visual devices. Which music scares them the most? Yeah. <laughs> that would work for me. Uh, we'll, we'll get to auditory here in a second. Um, as far as the visual devices are concerned, though, Efficacy is not usually very high. Um, there are exceptions to the rule. For example, scare eye balloons sometimes work well for woodpeckers. Woodpeckers tend to be pretty neophobic. They're afraid of new things. And so if they're poking holes in your side and you hang one of these things up out there, sometimes that's enough to push them elsewhere. <laughs> but most species, they don't work very well for. Um, so it's something that you certainly could try, but I wouldn't get too excited about having real positive results. Just, I noticed when I was reading the chapter, they don't mention, um, I don't know if you call it a windsock or a puppet, mm -hmm. but it costs about $85. The hair dancers? And No, it's the shape of an osprey, and I bought it in San Marcos, on San Marcos Boulevard, the big nursery there, because I have um, a mockingbird. And we tried everything, BB gun, water cannons, and uh, the mockingbird kept us up all night, literally. Only, only in and we put this thing up, it's about 25 feet tall, it's on a piece of fishing wire, and it flies, and that mockingbird never came down. So that was really brilliant, and it's a puppet. The, those kinds of um, deterrents are spotty. Sometimes they do work. Sometimes they do work. It depends on the individual animal. Um, the problem is, is the birds eventually realize that it's not a real osprey. Well, probably what happened is the bird moved somewhere else and never came back, so to speak. Um, but if you had a bird that was hanging around in the area and, and didn't mind coming back or whatnot, then it, it probably wouldn't have worked for as long a period of time. But still, that's the thing about birds, and that's the thing about frightening devices, is I can give you generalities, but none of these are absolute. Um, in some cases, putting things up that don't normally work might work. In a lot of cases, though, they won't. And so what I'm giving is more of the general description of what typically works or doesn't work. But there can be exceptions to the rule, absolutely. In my neighborhood, tons of people have outdoor lanterns and outdoor chandeliers over dining areas and in their entries. And um, the discs, the, C, the old CD discs are working. Mm -hmm. they, they no longer land mm -hmm. on, the, on the object. Okay. Not yeah. gorgeous looking. Yes. Better than very Understood. Good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I just had one comment to make about the uh, carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. On the web, you can read. We haven't done it because I didn't know, you know, what it would what it would do to the soil. But you, they said to put a hose in your exhaust to your car and put the hose down in the. Yeah, <laughs> that is old-fashioned way. That is one that I've actually I've, I've asked DPR if that's a legal application or not. Um, well, because technically the way the law reads is something along the lines of pressurized exhaust. And there's been some debate as to whether or not car exhaust is pressurized or not. I've never heard of anyone getting in trouble for it, so I think you're probably fine. But there's a couple things to keep in mind. Number one is heated exhaust, whereas the exhaust that comes from these other machines is cooled. So the heated exhaust has the potential, at least, for fire issues. Um, also, the animal is more likely to feel the heat and be 
off-put by that as well. Yeah. So that actually may not be quite as good. The other important thing to remember is if it's a vehicle with a catalytic converter, it's also not creating as much carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. So it may not work anyways because you don't have those toxic gases there. Um, that's why a lot of people who use that approach actually use lawnmowers or something like that that don't have catalytic converters. Yeah. I have a friend up in Volcano who tried that. He's got 10 acres. I mean, I can't tell you how gallons of gas he went through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, I've heard long, that, long, long heard that before. Yeah. 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 Hold on one second. We've got like five minutes and i got a few things to get through here. So you can ask me afterwards if you would like. All right. <laughs> um, just, just a couple more slides to get through, though. Um, we're talking about frightening devices. There are, of course, auditory devices as well, devices that make noise uh, to scare, scare birds away. Unfortunately, most of these are not practical in a backyard setting. Um, there are propane cannons that growers will use on almond or pistachio trees that can work for a short period of time and scaring birds away. Way too loud for town. Um, we've got electronic distress, distress calls, which actually work pretty good for crows and work fairly well for some other species too. Uh, but once again, may not be ideal in a lot of residential situations. Uh, devices shot by roving patrols, basically shot from guns, bird bombs and shell crackers work pretty good, but you're not using those in town either. So that's the problem with a lot of these auditory devices is that they're simply not going to be a practical option uh, around town. And because a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the visual de uh, devices don't work in a lot of cases too, it leaves, leaves homeowners pretty frustrated sometimes on how to deal with bird problems. And, and the ultimate answer a lot of times is, is I don't know. <laughs> um, we can give them some ideas to try. Um, but there's no guarantees that any of them will work. Uh, repellents. Um, repellents are another option for some species. Of course, re repellents, we're talking about uh, chemicals that uh, create objectionable odors or unpleasant tastes. Um, marketed for just about every animal out there, but they don't work well for most of them. Um, but they can work for some. They do work relatively well for deer. They do work relatively well for rabbits. Um, but there are still limitations. For example, if the bush that you put them on is the only thing that the rabbit has to eat, the repellent's probably not going to be near as effective because it's either eat this or die, and they're going to eat it. But if there's lots of other good options for them out there, the repellents can be effective at moving them on to, to other um, things to eat. The kind of repellent also matters, too. There's various different active ingredients in these repellents, and some work better than others. Usually those that are um, fear-inducing, or those that have post-ingestive consequences are the ones that work better. Um, post-ingestives would be like thyroid, which is a fungicide. The animal eats it, causes them to get sick, and then they won't eat it again. So they have to eat it once, but that will be enough to make them sick and they won't eat it again. Uh, some of them that have the uh, sulfur compounds smell like rotten eggs. Um, those tend to work pretty well, too. That's a fear-inducing odor for a lot of these animals. Those that rely on pain receptors like capsaicin don't typically work as well. As, as some of the others. Also, it's important to remember with repellents, they have to be reapplied. So you need to read the, read the label and figure out when to reapply. But if it rains, in a lot of cases, you have to reapply it. If you get new shoot growth, you have to reapply it. So you have to be diligent with repellents in order for them to work. Um, there are some other things like ultrasonic devices for keeping moles and gophers out. Theoretically, they don't work. Um, and they're pretty expensive, so that's something we would not recommend. Water sprayers, this is a scarecrow, I think it's called. Um, basically, it emits a passive infrared beam. Something walks along, breaks that beam, and it squirts them with water. I've never seen any studies done on these, but I have, I have talked to a lot of people, and they actually think they work pretty well. I suspect they very well may work for small flower gardens or something like that. If you get a deer that likes to come up and, and munch on the flowers occasionally, put one of these out, squirt it with water, that's probably going to be enough to send it on its way. Um, don't place these by sidewalks, though, because they're be unhappy neighbors. Uh, shooting, you know, if, if you happen to be in a rural enough area, shooting can be an effective option uh, for a variety of different species. Um, but obviously, in most residential or all residential areas, that's not going to be an option. Yeah. The Migratory Bird legal? Treaty Act is going to kill anybody that shoots any bird. Well, if it's a migratory bird, not yeah. any bird. No, you can shoot, for example, you can shoot crows even without a depredation permit. Yeah. You can shoot um, pigeons without a depredation permit. But, it, but it's it illegal in urban? Yeah, urban? yeah. There's, Just if you're out in the country. Right, right. If, you, if you're on your own property out of Timbuktu, 
Um, and it is legal to shoot some of those species without a depredation permit. Others you can get a depredation permit for even if they're on the migratory treaty. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of that one. Huh? Well, yeah, it, it is more difficult. It is more difficult. Yeah. So, in closing, uh, basically we've covered three of the steps of an effective management program, which is identifying species causing damage, assessing your options, and then uh, developing and implementing a management program. The fourth and final step then was, of course, monitoring. Well, we've talked about the importance of monitoring in some cases, but in other cases it's probably not going to be as important. So with that, we'll just, we'll just leave it with that. Um, here are some useful websites. Uh, that, that contain additional information, such as the UCIPM pest notes. Uh, San Diego County actually has um, some really good uh, vertebrate pest control videos on their site that Terry Selman and others helped to create. Um, Scott, were you involved with that? Ah, see, Scott was involved with that too. Um, if you're ever interested as to whether or not endangered species could be present on somebody's property, you can look that up at this particular website. That's kind of a useful tool. And the vertebrate pest control handbook also has a lot of useful information on a lot of these pest species that we've been talking about, and in particular bird species. Uh, the IPM pest notes are a little bit lacking on some of the bird species. Um, this particular site has lots of information on a variety of bird species and, and um, potential options for managing them. So, can I ask my question? Well, yes, you can. <laughs> Uh -huh. they, yeah, it probably has something to do with either a reflection or them not realizing there's a window there. Sometimes the best strategy is just to um, put something there to let them know that there's a window here or some kind of a reflective structure. Sometimes it's as simple as putting a wire screen up. Sometimes it's um, maybe taping, putting strands of black tape or something across it to let them know that, hey, there's something here. Um, but just trying to come up with something to let them know that, hey, this is actually a window and not a thoroughfare or another bird or something like that. Oh, Toby. Yeah. It's always possible he's deranged, too. <laughs> 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 